Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fifth and final State of Health session for this week as one of the most challenging years, probably the most challenging year for our sector, Victoria, and indeed the whole world draws to a close. My name is Tom Simonson, and I'm the CEO of the Victorian Healthcare Association, and today we're here to celebrate a year which is difficult to describe in one word, let alone a whole event, but we will try. To start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are all meeting uh, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and particularly to the Jaja Warung people where I am, on whose land I am located. If you haven't watched yesterday's session, we had uh, a fantastic talk from Zioni Walker, uh, a change maker in um, Victorian circles. Um, and we also heard from uh, Aisha, a proud um, indigenous woman who has recently won uh, the Aware Super Emerging Leaders um, Scholarship. And uh, she spoke about her background and her hopes uh, for the future and also reflected on that fantastic um, uh, conversation with Zioni. Um, if you haven't watched that, I would very much encourage you to have a look. You can, you can get it on our website. Uh, you can also get all of the other sessions from the week uh, on our website. At the end of today, I'll, I'll reflect on some of the highlights of the week. Uh, and I want to thank everybody so far who has been in contact to share their reflections and everyone who has been contributing to the conversation online. As I mentioned, uh, today is about celebrating the incredible sector and the people who bring it to life. Uh, and I will shortly be introducing a presentation from the Nossel Institute who've been recording and capturing stories from across the sector through voice recordings from the high points to the low points. We'll also be unveiling a virtual time capsule, which we have created as a space where you can share your photos and reflections on the past 12 months. But first, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on some of the work our team at the VHA has been doing to support the sector throughout the year. And it has been an incredibly busy year, despite the fact that we have spent almost all of it um, in our homes rather than in our office. Um, we have conducted sector-wide consultations invo involving um, multiple uh, workshops, all via Zoom, um, plus hundreds of phone conversations and online um, form submissions around issues such as clusters, um, uh, response to COVID, uh, Aged Care Royal Commission, and uh, many other things. We've developed a virtual professional development program to support boards and executives over the past 12 months, which has been attended by many on our boards uh, and, uh, and leading our health services and community health services from across the state. And we will be having more of those sessions in 2021. In partnership with Mental Health Victoria and Deloitte, uh, we delivered uh, a number of mental health sector forums, three this year and one at the end of last year, uh, involving more than 300 members uh, from the sector and providing a space to share learnings and innovations as we approach the final report of the Royal Commission into the mental health system. We've produced dozens of submissions um, in an enormous range of subjects of interest to the sector. And we're incredibly grateful to all of you for your input into those. We couldn't do it with, we couldn't produce them without it. And we've hosted various forums and discussions from aged care to community health, um, to issues of uh, uh, governance uh, and um, community engagement and everything in between. And we've produced briefings on key issues for the sector on a whole range of issues. And we've produced a daily, then weekly, and then fortnightly COVID-19 wrap up to bring together as much information as possible in one place for those of you working in the sector, because we recognize very early on that the messaging on COVID was incredibly complicated and coming from multiple sources. And we wanted to put it all in one place. And that became our most read uh, resource very, very quickly. And I think has remained so most of the way through the pandemic. I want to thank all of the members of the VHA team for their hard work and dedication. Um, none of this would have been possible without the support of our members, our colleagues in state and federal governments, and our partners, and I thank all of them for their ongoing commitment. As you may have seen throughout the week, we've been sharing messages and updates from our corporate partners, and I would like to thank them for their continued support of our work with the sector um, and, and of the sector itself. Thank you to our principal partner, Aware Super, our advisory assurance and tax partner, Grant Thornton, our legal partner, Russell Kennedy Lawyers, our governance partner, Governance Evaluator, 
Bank First and One Passport. We've also been fortunate to hear from a number of ministers this week as part of our State of Health events, including the Minister for Mental Health, James Molino, and the Minister for Disability, Aging and Carers, Luke Dunellen, uh, on Wednesday. And yesterday afternoon, uh, we had a presentation from Minister for Health, Martin Foley. I would like to thank the ministers for their continued support and their encouragement of the sector and the work of the VHA. I'd now like to introduce a statement from the Shadow Minister for Health, Georgie Crozier. Um, the VHA is proudly um, apolitical, bipartisan, um, and uh, we were uh, uh, delighted that Georgie provided the following statement for the sector. Victoria has had a difficult and arduous year, from the devastation of the bushfires in the north and east of the state in January to the COVID-19 pandemic that has caused so much sadness and created so much stress and uncertainty. Victorians have proved that they are resilient in the face of adversity, but it's important that we acknowledge the health, social and economic impacts this year has had on all of us. As Victorians resume their daily lives in a COVID safe manner, it's easy to think that we have fully recovered from the effects of the pandemic. However, it is important that we do not neglect underlying mental health issues and long-term impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. We must actively seek to avert a widespread mental health crisis brought on by the pains of the lockdowns, social isolation and loss of employment for many. This is the reality and we must not become complacent. Concerningly, the pandemic exacerbated the already ailing elective surgery capacity of the state. While it was important to ensure that our health services were prepared to deal with widespread COVID outbreaks, thousands of Victorians have had to wait in pain and suffering as these services were suspended. It is vital that in 2021, our health services are given expert guidance and adequate resources to ensure that the waitlist numbers are brought down. Importantly, we must all be proactive in attending to our personal health and wellbeing. It has been devastating to see the reduction of cancer screenings across the state, as well as specialist appointments. We know that early detection of cancer gives people the greatest chance of recovery. Victorians should not put off these vital screenings and appointments. We cannot let one health crisis foster another. Amidst the trying times that have been 2020, Victoria's healthcare professionals have been extremely resilient facing COVID-19. I'd like to thank them all for their professionalism and diligence and acknowledge the strains placed on their personal lives, including relationships with family and friends. Many staff were quarantined and furloughed to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in their workplace. These were difficult arrangements for those affected, but ultimately this helped to protect the health of their fellow Victorians. I know that in many instances there was insufficient PPE. Despite this, healthcare workers continued to go to work to maintain the health and well-being of our state, fully aware of the risks posed. I'll always advocate for the provision of high quality PPE to all healthcare workers to ensure that they are safe in their workplace as they perform their important duties. As 2020 draws to a close, I want to wish all our healthcare workers and those involved within our health sector a merry and safe Christmas and a happy new year. Let us hope that with several vaccines abroad showing promising signs that 2021 will bring new hope. Thank you, Georgie. Um, <clears throat> now, those healthcare workers that, that Georgie and all of the ministers have all spoken about, um, they now become our focus. The pandemic has shone a spotlight on the people who keep our healthcare system running day in and day out. And uh, this uh, last nine or 10 months, that has been very much the case. There have been people not having a, a day off in, in, in months on end. Um, and also highlighted the broad range of people involved in keeping our hospitals and community health services running. From the doctors and nurses, to cleaners and cooks, to the administration officers and volunteers, the allied health professionals, the support workers, the people who deliver services are as diverse as the services they deliver and the community that they deliver them to. And the pandemic has hit them all hard with the particularly challenging situation of both living and working with such a global issue. 
Since the early days of the pandemic, the Nossel Institute of Global Health have been capturing stories from across the sector using voice recordings left by healthcare workers at the end of shifts. And today I'm delighted to welcome one of the people leading this project to tell us a bit more about what they've found and share some of those stories. It's my pleasure to introduce Daniel Strachan, a senior technical advisor at the Nossel Institute, who's been leading this project. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Tom. Thank you very much for the introduction and um, to echo your comments. It's um, I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about the voices of health workers of the many uh, different types that you've just uh, described. I'd like to, to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work, the Wurundjeri people and their elders past, present and future. Uh, I'm Daniel Strawn. I'm from the Nossel Institute for Global Health at the University of Melbourne. And I'm here today representing my colleagues, Catherine Gilbert and Claire Strawn, with whom I developed the COVID-19 Health Worker Voices WhatsApp channel. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So next slide, please. Thank you. So the premise of our concept for the Health Worker Voices um, WhatsApp channel is to capture stories from health workers that are involved in some way. And we're all touched by COVID-19, but it, health workers that are involved in some way in the COVID-19 response and the aftermath. So we understood uh, early on that the sharing of stories and the insights that they provide are critically important if we're to learn the lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So what is it? What is the COVID-19 Health Worker Voices WhatsApp channel? Well, it's a mechanism over the mean, through the means of WhatsApp to collect stories in the form of audio files from a range of health workers responding to the COVID-19 pandemic in their local context. So a health worker simply follows a link and privately interacts with WhatsApp. They enter a few short details and then tell us what's most important for them right now. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge our colleagues at the School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne with whom we launched Health Worker Voices. So we wanted to set up Health Worker Voices because we were aware of how critical health worker insights have been to appropriate preparation and response in previous pandemics. For instance, we were um, mindful of the lessons from the Ebola outbreaks uh, in recent years, and we saw how ground staff understood the community's healthcare needs within logistical, historical and social contexts. So, for instance, it was health workers' stories and insights in the Democratic of, uh, Republic of Congo that ultimately helped demystify for the community why clinics full of foreigners in PPE suits appeared to be taking locals away to die. So health systems rely on functional human interaction and critically the skills, insights, judgments and adaptations of health workers. This dependence is heightened in a pandemic context when contributions must be maximised in order to meet the high and evolving volume of need. So from that perspective, we need the perspectives and insights of health workers. They're critical to how we respond and build resilience of our health system. Our next slide, please. So how does it work? Well, a key principle is we ask because we don't know. So we ask health workers for their insights from their perspectives. We're not prescriptive and we only offer minor prompts. We welcome any insights and stories from any time and any perspective from health workers of all types. We're inclusive. We're particularly interested in challenges and solutions in the face of COVID. And the key is to access what health workers feel is important and want to share. The channel itself is quick and easy. And importantly, the identity of respondents is protected by encrypting the data, not storing phone numbers from the health workers and not reporting any identifiable features of respondents. Uh, next slide, please. Well, why do we do it? We're not aware of another project that aims to digit to digitally capture stories from diverse cadres of health workers across varied contexts in the face of COVID-19. 
with the data we collect, we potentially have the capacity to provide insight regarding many of the important questions raised as our health systems and health workers are challenged through COVID. We can ask questions of how we've we been able to respond, what influences our capacity to respond. We can collate and capture what the solutions that have been applied. We can explore how we've innovated and met patient needs under extreme duress. We can explore with the challenges that have persisted and how we've adapted and coped on many levels. But such questions are rarely asked and recorded and are often collated or become challenging to recall in useful detail retrospectively. So it's essential that we get the real time data as we're being challenged by COVID. Um, the result of this, this absence in the past has been a lack of evidence of the kind that may help us prepare for epidemics and build health worker and health system resilience. Next slide, please. Well, what will we do with the stories that we capture? Well, we can review stories that we capture against the pandemic trajectory and compare over time, setting and the type of workers as well as the themes of response. This will help generate more specific, nuanced and insightful contributions for improved health system responses and preparedness for both current and future epidemics. Importantly, as a second, as a aligned benefit of what we what we produce through Health Worker Voices, we provide an outlet for health workers. And the idea is that we wanted to create an opportunity to share experiences privately during what has been a high pressure time. We've had one respondent, for instance, a nurse record up to 10 stories as a form of diary of her experience for the year. Uh, next slide, please. So Health Worker Voices so far, we rolled out Health Worker Voices in May of this year, um, seems like an age ago. Um, since then, we've heard a range of stories of many shades and providing a, a, a catalog of uh, a wide range of insights. Some have been sad and challenging. Others have been hopeful and optimistic, and many have been reflective. Um, they're varied in length, and every story has been important and useful. So we would like to um, present to you now uh, a selection of quotes that some of our health workers have um, left us with as read by actors, not from the health workers themselves. Thank you. We've been wearing face masks for the last couple of weeks. Uh, guys, we're just starting to get used to them and now we've implemented face shields as well. Uh, I left with a massive, massive headache the very first day. And the second day I had a little headache. The third day wasn't too bad and now Monday off, which I was so excited about. I literally could not wait because it makes it very hard to hear anything that's going on around you with another person that's working, which makes it really hard to be discreet about anything um, going on because you have to raise your voice so that you can be heard. Um, I have a real struggle between what we're doing to protect them from COVID as opposed to what we can do giving them a good quality of life. I guess I do struggle with that. I mean, there's quite a few residents that have trouble hearing. They use your volume and reading your lips and they're missing out on both of those things. So it's that bit that disheartens me and it makes me really sad giving someone a hug when they're feeling upset. Like that's what I go to. That's my go-to at the start of the year. I would do that a lot. I'd say, would you like a hug? And sometimes that would be all it needed to change people's day around. Now we're not allowed to do that and it really breaks my heart. There's a general prevailing mood of nerves and anxiety, so much that one of the display screens has been converted into a de-stressing display, which was alternating between puppies and an aquarium and things like that because some of the staff were finding that they needed something. I think I have to give credit to the months of work that's been done preparing us and also on wellbeing, which, you know, it might seem token in a sense, but actually having a real impact on us. So basically every day, every shift you're on, there's huge amounts of food being donated, all sorts of things being left for us in the tea room and passed around it does give you the sense that 
you know, that that we're being supported and the and and thought of and cared of and it does help because the work the work is hard. COVID is significantly affecting us in our personal lives as well. So it's not just something that we're managing at work. It's the work and the home situation that is having to be balanced for everyone. And everyone has a unique set of challenges. So some people have family who are sick or family who are high risk. Others have no support systems. Others have no one at home. So their social network is at work. Or many who are used to being in very much a social aspect at work. We're now, because we're not in direct clinical facing roles, many of us are being told to work from home basically, and that's really difficult. So they're not maintaining that social network that you would normally have at work and a lot of time at home alone. And obviously COVID is all day at work and then COVID is all day at home as well. So it's significant in terms of that ongoing stress and ongoing having to try and find something else as a release and as the time away from all the conversations about COVID. Okay, so um, some quotes there from our health workers that have contributed. Looking to towards 2021 now, well, what's happening in Sydney's Northern Beaches is a, is a clear reminder that COVID will be with us for some time yet. Um, there'll be evolving circumstances that we can't entirely predict as we sit here today. So whether it's related to different phases of response or adapting to a new normal of service delivery, and of course, the, the rollout of a vaccine, um, we have health workers best positioned to critique, reflect and explain and share their stories in place already. So we hope to continue to receive uh, stories from existing and new health workers. Um, I think there's a, another brief video about our project now, and then I'll uh, explain where you can find us and access Health Worker Voices. Okay, so to, to read more about Health Worker Voices and of course, most importantly, to share your story and to um, share this opportunity to share stories with health workers, please do find us on Twitter and on our website, which you can see here. Uh, the website also has a link to a how-to video that takes you through the, the channel and how to interact with. And as the video just said then, all you have to do is message hello to the, to the um, WhatsApp channel and then it will um, ask you questions and invite you to make a, make a contribution of an audio file. It's very simple, it's confidential and all stories are important. Thanks very much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so the first question I suppose from me is, what surprised you about this research? Was, was it, did you get what you thought you would get or was it completely different, take, came completely out of left field or was it a bit of both? Um, yeah, great question. I guess the exciting thing about the research, Tom, was that we were non-prescriptive. So we really didn't know. We were asking because we didn't know. And um, I guess it's always a, a privileged position to be in when someone provides such a rich insight in their personal and professional um, experience. So I guess um, we're constantly surprised by the level of nuanced detail that people can convey very quickly in 30, 30 seconds or less sometimes, or even up to five minutes, people were speaking to at different times. So um, I guess the, the diversity and the different, the different ways that people used the, um, the channel to um, communicate what they thought was most important was a surprise, but also it pleased us because that was the purpose really. Did, did you, you mentioned one person who called 10 mm. times or more. Um, did, did you get people kind of using it as a cathartic process to, you know, almost not caring if anybody listened just to be able to get it out? Mm. Um, 
I guess that's ultimately hard to gauge what their, their, the motivations were for, for doing it. But I guess it's implicit if the, um, uh, this particular respondent did come back and use it as a diary function. And we, we were really pleased with that. That was our, we, we wanted to be able to um, perhaps look at, over time at what had happened from a data perspective. But we're also really pleased that this, this particular worker found that um, useful. Uh, their particular contribution was um, useful from a content point of view. So a, a clear driver for them was to make a contribution for the betterment of the health system to, for, to help us understand the lessons. But we, we somewhat assumed that there was perhaps a benefit to them in, in sharing that as well. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting kind of question. One of the, mm -hmm. the people uh, that was um, quoted was talking about how it was nice that there were things being left for them so they knew people were thinking of them and you can kind of i think one of our reflections is maybe that wasn't felt universally across the system some people may have felt more kind of cared for and looked after than others and and, and it's something that we'll be certainly interested to look back on what can we do to help people across the health system feel that kind of support would you would you say you had more people talking about how uh, more, what was the level of struggle, I suppose, because because some of those were quite positive, I suppose, constructive quotes. Um, but were you getting a significant number of people who really were finding it incredibly tough and were just kind of unleashing that? Um, not so much. I, I, I have to say, I think um, on the whole, the um, there was a high level of resolve and um, pragmatic application, um, I would say, to the to the challenge. And also, a, um, I think, a, perhaps, a, again, implicit rather than explicit will to be able to just get on with the job and do the, do the job and be seen as professionals rather than being put on a pedestal. Um, the, the appreciation is, um, is, is, uh, was appreciated, but also just this is a challenge that they've got the skills and they're in the right place to meet. And um, so there was, a, this is how we're gonna do it. This is how we'll proceed. There was some um, anxiety, mostly on behalf of the patients. Um, so perhaps the, the barriers to access for um, carer families to, to loved ones that are experiencing tough times. So mostly on behalf of the people that they were um, serving, I think, more than themselves. Well, it's interesting, we had a, a conversation a few weeks ago with um, uh, someone doing some research in the UK, and I asked the question about, you know, the, the, the clapping every week that people mm. in the community were doing, and, and did that make people feel better? And the response was not really, because they go and clap, and then they all go to the pub and don't socially distance and get sick and then make the healthcare workers work harder. So it's kind of that, it's that interesting, does the appreciation matter as much as feeling like you're able to do your job properly? Mm. Your, your patients, your clients are safe and you're giving them the service they deserve. Um, we've, we've had a question from Karen. Um, have you been able to identify different types of stresses for workers in and outside COVID hotspots? Um, I think at this stage we're at, um, it's a great question, and I think it speaks to how we're able to analyze the data going forward. Um, I think we've been pleased at the diversity of what we've been able to capture across a range of settings. And we're um, in the process of trying to gather more and more data at this stage. In terms of analyzing against hotspots, that geographic, um, isolation is somewhat limited in terms of what we're able to to do with our analysis and that's somewhat governed by our privacy limitations so we don't want to be able to really isolate where um, respondents are broad uh, more broadly than the type of worker they are the type of facility or uh, their operation and the country of operation so what we can infer is from the the way they speak and what they're talking about from a content perspective we can um, think about the nature of the challenges they were facing at that time and then cross with what was in the news cycle and our understanding of um, what was unfolding at that particular point at that particular in that particular space. So um, in terms of really mapping, it'd be lovely to be able to do say um, uh, geographic mapping against uh, the, the, the pandemic um, 
uh, as it unfolded, but that's not really what we're able to do. What we're able to do is provide that human nuanced um, content around the lived experience at the time. So the real time insights. Yeah, and your ethics approval might have been more difficult if you'd <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> not, yeah. not those controls. Um, would you, it, talking of the time at which people were, were giving these messages and the fact that uh, you can kind of work out broadly where they were um, in some cases, did you see a really marked correlation between the event and the level of emotion or the types of things that were be being shared, you know, for the Victorian context, wave one, then wave two, a bit in between, now what we've got after wave two. Is, is, there, mm. is that correlation really obvious? Yeah, I think the type of stories is. Um, I, think, I think there was, um, as the wave was coming, I think that the, the nature of stories were, were, are we ready? Are we, have we got everything in place? Can we, can we cope? And then when the incidents, the case rates were climbing, there was a level of anxiety about whether things, uh, aspects were, uh, that were necessary for the service delivery required were in place and people were getting tired. So a theme was that we are stretched. Um, but then in other cases, we had some interesting responses from Central Australia where they were saying, we've, we've been able to innovate and flex and we've, 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 we look like we're on top of this. Um, so yeah, there, there's, um, it's been, there's been an interesting array of responses in that space, but we can see how they change over time, certainly. And there's a question from Gloria, that will the app be operational more broadly than as a response for COVID? So will you continue to use it? Well, that's a fabulous question. It was, it was set up ostensibly for COVID and we, we see COVID broadly. I mean, we think it's touched all aspects of um, the health service and it will continue to for some time. So we see it through that lens as we, we've, um, we're challenged to uh, adapt with blended service delivery and all sorts of adaptations that we're making. But beyond that, uh, the, the um, functionality and operation of the channel is very simple and it can be repurposed certainly for other for other ends, whether it's sort of within a localized um, system or more broadly with a different content area. So, I mean, we, we'd um, be really happy to speak to people about collaborations. We're very interested in working with you to um, potentially promote to your health workers, um, those that you know, but also to uh, repackage and repurpose potentially. I think the, the potential to capture, we've got, we've got the capacity to scale this quite significantly as well. We've built the back end with that in mind. Um, so we, and again, because we weren't prescriptive, we had to be able to cope with what came from the data and how it was going to be used. So I think we have that capacity. So yeah, it just depends how it can be useful really. Absolutely. Well, and I think it's a, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's a relatively simple kind of, um, elegant uh, response, but it's something that other people haven't thought of, and it hasn't been done more broadly. And I think it's an excellent, um, it's an excellent innovation in terms of giving people that opportunity to share their stories. But it's also hopefully going to have an impact through the research that you do with the results um, and what we do to to use them to make everything work a little bit better, hopefully, and mm -hmm. in the system more broadly. But also next time this happens, let's hope touch wood that is never. Um, Thank you very much, Daniel, for um, for sharing your your research and 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 particularly uh, interesting to hear those quotes. Um, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing further details of the research as it unfolds. Thank you, Tom, and thanks for the to all for the uh, big year that you've all had. Appreciate it. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our final partner message of the week uh, from Bank First. Hi, Adrian Wilson from Bank First. As we all know, and I feel pretty silly saying it to be honest, 2020 has been a challenging year, particularly uh, for our customers, many of whom have worked on the front line in healthcare. Um, from the summer bushfires through to the challenges of COVID-19, you know, our customers in the bank have remained committed to support 
uh, providing support through these times. And for those of you who haven't heard me speak before, I, I do come with enough experience to appreciate that talking about our products and services, their features and benefits and our competitive rates and low fee structure aren't particularly appealing uh, to everybody all of the time. But what I am passionate talking about is our story because I, I do think it's an interesting run as, as 48 caring people just like yourselves got together in 1972, each putting $10 into a shoebox to start a bank that looked after the um, those that care, those who work in healthcare, those who work in education. Today we're a bank that's growing to $3 billion in assets and over 100,000 customers. What's probably most significant in this day and age is that we're still the same customer owned bank and are solely uh, or so socially and ethically um, responsible. Uh, our profits go to support our caring communities and to support our customers. The values of our founders still actually guide the decision making today and are at the heart of everything that we do. Uh, during the year, we readily offered financial assistance to our customers in need. We continue to support uh, and, and work alongside our business partners, such as the Victorian Healthcare Association, and give to our most vulnerable through donations and grants. We launched a thank you campaign to ensure that our uh, healthcare and education customers knew that we appreciated the work that they were doing during the year. And excitingly, uh, very recently, we partnered with Pinchapoo to provide essential personal hygiene packs to support emergency departments across Melbourne, which will be launching early uh, next year. As a bank that was born out of care and compassion, that places value in what people do for the community, not simply how much money they make, one of the huge positives for me uh, is the broader community support and recognition of our key workers as the year has gone on. On personal reflection, I'm a very proud husband of a wife that's worked for over 10 years as a nurse, actually at Eastern uh, Health at Maroondah Hospital, and I've certainly experienced the different community reactions towards healthcare workers over the course of the year. I've seen firsthand the physical and emotional resilience, and most astonishingly, I think, uh, the selfless dedication of those working in the health community. Understanding that whilst uh, those who work in the health community have been dealing with COVID, you know, you guys have still had to juggle everyday life. For us, it was homeschooling three primary school age boys and entertaining a toddler in lockdown all before the afternoon shift started. You know, as far as I'm concerned, you all deserve medals. As a proud partner of the Victorian Healthcare Association and a bank that exists to serve healthcare workers, um, now more than ever, we really want to say thank you for everything that you do. And I hope that in 2021, we get to know each other a little bit better so that we can support you and your staff. I also want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas, a safe and happy new year. I hope that you all manage to have some time off for you and your families. Thank you. Thank you to Adrian and the team for your ongoing support. And as I said at the beginning, thank you to all of our um, partners um, without whom we wouldn't be able to run all of the activities and the services that we are able to do. I'm now delighted to unveil our virtual time capsule as a space where you and your colleagues can share photos, stories and links which highlight the incredible efforts of our sector across the past 12 months. As you can see, many people have already started adding their stories and I would just like to highlight a couple as they appear. Um, I'd also like to encourage you to share the link with your team and your colleagues and help gather as many stories and images uh, that represent 2020 as possible. Um, I have been uh, really um, very much drawn to uh, places like LinkedIn and Facebook during this process because, or during this period of time, because we end up with um, stories like this one with Sharon Strzelecki <laughs> dancing um, with uh, members of the, the, health, the health team. Um, and uh, sometimes I'm not quite sure who's come up with these things, but um, um, they always seem to be very well received. Um, so it's it's a fantastic it's a fantastic way to share stories, um, and we hope that we can use this platform um, to further um, expand the reach of the wonderful things that teams across the state in every service um, are doing. You can see that Grampians Community Health are a little overrepresented here. That's because they've been incredibly active um, in uh, their local community, trying to keep spirits up. Um, and you would know that in rural areas, whilst we haven't had anywhere near as many infections. Um, the lockdown has been in place just as it has been everywhere else. So that, uh, that connection with community has been really important. Another one to highlight is the 150 year anniversary of the Royal Children's Hospital, which I think is called a sesquicentenary. Um, 
for anybody who likes a pub quiz and don't correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, I'd rather think I've got that right. Um, and a wonderful anniversary, 150 years of that fantastic health service. So thank you to everyone for sharing your stories. Uh, and I look forward to watching this grow um, over the coming weeks and reviewing it in more detail as the year comes to an end. So in 2020, we had a number of health services and health organizations across Victoria planning uh, to celebrate significant milestones. A lot of people have been hanging out for 2020 because it meant you could have a 2020 vision. Um, and unfortunately for most people and most organizations, if they hadn't done it by sort of late February, they didn't get to have that celebration. Um, and they've had to shift uh, those plans and those events uh, either online or forward in time to 2021 or beyond. So we just wanted to take a moment to recognize some of those achievements. Um, and we have a short montage which highlights some of the significant milestones that have been reached. Uh, I already mentioned um, the 100th 150th anniversary of the Royal Children's Hospital, um, but we have members celebrating milestones from 35 years to 165 years. Um, and uh, it's, it's an incredible achievement to have an organization uh, being around for that long. So we apologize in advance if we missed any key dates, um, but I'd like to congratulate all of our members on their long-standing commitments to the community.
celebrating those milestones properly um, with many more of our members across the state in 2021. You would have noticed, we talked about the Royal Children's Hospital and also there was Ballarat Health Services, which was 160 years, um, but you would have noticed a number of community health services with anniversaries of 45 years from 1975. And um, uh, that, that means uh, that was the time when community health was being set up. Um, and so a number of our community health services will be celebrating that um, anniversary uh, now. Um, and in a couple of years, uh, we'll be approaching the 50th anniversary of community health or most community health services in Victoria. So that'll be a big milestone in uh, 2025. Um, that brings us to the conclusion of our state of health events for 2020. And I'm truly grateful to all of our guests for sharing their insights and experiences with us this week. I just want to finish by summarizing some of the key takeaways from those sessions. Um, uh, on Monday, we had a, a fantastic panel with uh, journalist Sarah James, uh, Grant MacArthur and Melissa Sweet, Grant from the Herald Sun and Melissa from Crokey. And the key thing to take away from that presentation is just how quickly the pandemic unfolded, how quickly the health sector became uh, very, very central um, in the story and central in everybody's lives uh, and something which has had both positive and negative effects. And also hearing uh, Grant talk about the personal um, kind of impact on him of reporting um, on this, uh, uh, this enormous um, event in our lives. On Tuesday, we spoke with Emma King from Vicos, uh, and the key thing from that conversation was reinforcement of the important role our health services and our community health services uh, in delivering services to our most vulnerable communities. And, and those communities that were vulnerable pre-COVID, that vulnerability was really exacerbated during the pandemic. It wasn't created then, um, but it was much, uh, much, much worse, and our attention was much, much more drawn towards it. So um, Emma was making that that point very clearly on Tuesday. On Wednesday, uh, we had uh, two ministers, uh, Minister for Mental Health uh, and the Minister for Aged Care and Disabilities. Um, uh, they not only praised the work of the sector, but also acknowledged the challenges of the year and those that lie ahead. But most importantly for me as a, an advocate on behalf of the sector was they expressed their great support um, for our sector um, and uh, willingness to work with us next year as we come into the recovery phase. And yesterday we had the opportunity to cast our minds to next year with Zioni Walker providing some fantastic insights into how the pandemic has changed the way we operate as individuals um, and also as organisations. And one of the key things to take with us into 2021 is to consider who is not around the table and seek them out. One of the things Zioni really um, focused on um, was the fact that we really have broadened our horizons in terms of who we engage and why we engage them during the pandemic, because in many cases, we've had no choice. As the health system, we have had to bring the community and those vulnerable communities that Emma talked about on Tuesday into the fold because they were the only people who knew how we had to respond to their needs. And we need to make sure that we don't lose that lesson um, as we move into 2021. So thank you again to all of our speakers, including the many members who shared their stories and provided reflections throughout the week. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And over the past few days, I know there are a number of people who have been at every one of these five events. I'm particularly grateful uh, to you, um, but we will be posting this video online shortly as we have with the other um, events for the last um, four days, which are already online. And I encourage you to share them with your colleagues and refer back to them as you head into the new year. And the conversation doesn't finish here. Please share your thoughts on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook with the hashtag State of Health and add your photos and stories to that time capsule we looked at earlier. Finally, from everyone at the Victorian Healthcare Association, we wish you a very happy festive season and as much as possible, a restful end to the year. You deserve it. Thank you and good morning. Mm -hmm.